So our speaker today is Professor Edward A. Lee. He's a professor of the Graduate School in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. He'll be discussing his new book, The Coevolution, The Entwined Futures of Humans and Machines. And that's pretty much all I have for an introduction. So uh, take it away. Great. I really appreciate the invitation to come do this. And uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to find out that the Humanist Society is actually continuing to do this every week and that uh, you're actually getting a really pretty good turnout. I, I had the pleasure of giving a talk uh, when, you, when you were doing these as live events uh, just last October. And uh, I found it to be a really rewarding experience with a lot of really good interactions with people. And um, I'm thrilled that uh, Alex and Matt uh, invited me to come talk again when they found out that my book had finally come out with uh, sort of the epitome of poor timing. Um, it was, uh, it appeared right at the time that rumors were flying that Amazon was going to actually suspend uh, shipments of everything non-essential, including books which they deem to be non-essential. Um, but, uh, and so I had a, a, a launch party for the book that consisted of exactly one participant, uh, just me, <laughs> um, and canceled uh, quite a number of events that had been scheduled. So it's really nice to be here to, you know, have a chance to talk about it. All right, getting started. Uh, the Coevolution. That's, uh, th that's the title of this book. I could perhaps start by just uh, explaining the significance of the graphic on the front, the uh, egg with the circuit board inside. That was inspired by a famous quote of Richard Dawkins, who, who said that a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. And the question that I raise and address in this book might be summarized as is, a human, a computer's way of making another computer. It's, the book is sort of a deep dive into the question about our relationship as humans with technology and particularly digital technology and software. And the really short summary of the theme of the book is that we humans have less control than we think over technology development. This has some pretty profound implications, I think. Uh, it has implications to public policy. There's a, a lot of people who are calling for more regulation as we're seeing technology have an effect on uh, democratic processes and we're seeing um, privacy issues arising and we're seeing a lot of people very worried about the future of work and how artificial intelligence is going to affect uh, the future of work and so forth. And in, in my opinion, it's extremely difficult to come up with good policy if you don't really understand the processes that you're trying to regulate. I wanna emphasize that my book is not a doomsday book. There's a lot of doomsday books out there that are talking about a runaway explosion of artificial intelligence and how humans are gonna completely lose control that's not what this book is about at all. I recommend if you're, if you're looking for a doomsday book, I suggest you go to, you know, some of these are really quite wonderful. I, one of the more recent ones, Human Compatible by my colleague Stuart Russell at Berkeley is a really wonderful read. But it's not really the topic of my book. My book is not, in fact, trying to predict the future at all. It's trying to look at the present. What is our relationship today with technology? So I'm gonna try something that I haven't tried before when talking about this book, which is actually to use the structure of the book itself as a guide. And I'll go through each of the chapters and try to give you a sense of what the story is that the, that the book tells. So the first chapter, the title of which is Half a Brain, introduces a metaphor of software-driven technological artifacts as uh, being viewed as really living in a, in a sense that they're, that they're actually interacting with humans as if they were a new life form on our planet. So I, I call them living digital beings, which I shortened to the acronym LDBs. And that in my informal conversation, uh, that became 
elder bees. I kept referring to them as just elder bees, and that sort of became a new word. I tried to use that word in the book, and uh, the publisher e eventually banished it. They thought that it was a silly word, and it would undermine the message uh, of the book to be using a silly word to, referring, to refer to these machines. But nevertheless, in informal conversation, I, I still tend to use that word. But this is a metaphor. It's a way of thinking about the relationship that we have with the machines. And one of my favorite uh, living digital beings is Wikipedia. And this particular image that you see is actually a view of a server rack at one of uh, Wikimedia Foundation's five data centers that serve up Wikipedia. And to me, it looks a little bit like looking into a, a living creature, although obviously it's made of silicon and wires. It's not a, it's not a biological creature. But Wikipedia is, in many ways, does function like, uh, like a living thing. It, re it responds to its environment. Its environment is the internet. It responds to stimulus from, from that environment. And I'll talk in a little more detail about many other ways that it actually resembles living things. I do want to point out that I've made a commitment, actually, to um, I will be donating all of the future royalties that I get from this book to the Wikimedia Foundation. So in some ways, it gives me uh, an ability to, to not feel uh, like a mercenary when I'm, when I'm actually talking about promoting my book, because I won't be profiting from it in any way. It's, uh, and I like the idea of the royalties being used to support one of my favorite uh, living digital beings. So it's not really, of course, directly supporting the, the living digital being, the software Wikipedia. It's actually supporting a community of humans at the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, th those humans are, are themselves, of course, nurturing the machines and nurturing the software. But there's an interplay between the humans and the machines because in some ways the machines and the software also nurture the humans because they are, you know, the, it, is, it is the machines and the software that end up bringing in the donations that end up paying the salaries of the people. So this interplay of, of humans and technology is um, represented in a, in a figure. The, the book has quite a number of uh, pictures in it, but um, this is uh, a device called a Kubi, which is actually, I would say, and now extinct uh, living digital being because uh, it failed in the marketplace. So it did, uh, the, the, the product didn't manage to bring enough revenue to support the humans to nurture the machines. Uh, but it's really representative of this kind of interplay between machines and humans. And I think that in this pandemic era that we're living in right now, we're really getting a tremendously rapid evolution of this particular mechanism by which we're interacting with each other through the machines. The way this Kubi works is that you put your iPad on it and then you can remotely, uh, using a camera from another device, present your face and rotate the thing and be a little bit more present in a room than you would be on a static screen. There's um, a, lot of, a lot more experimentation going on these days with our digital presence and our digital interaction uh, between us and, and other humans around us. And my book is really very much about that. It's also very much about the way that technology changes. And one of the themes that runs throughout my book is to view technology as an evolution rather than as top-down intelligent design. Now, I've been working as an engineer for about 40 years. And I started writing embedded software in the 1970s. And I always thought of what I was doing as effectively top-down intelligent design, that the artifacts that I was creating were completely the product of my own creative mind. And it's embarrassing to me how long it took me to realize that that's really not the case, that everything that I produce is so enormously influenced by the technological context and culture within which I create it, that it's really not quite right to see it as the result of top-down intelligent design. So this picture, which is also in my book, is me standing in front of a 
a ship that was commissioned by King Gustav II Adolf of Sweden in, and was launched in 1628. Um, it was built as part of an effort, uh, a war effort. Sweden was at war with Poland at the time, and Sweden had one of the most extensive navies at the time. And this, this boat was a pretty ambitious design, but it was a complete failure. When it was launched in 1628 on its maiden voyage, it had some 200 people on board celebrating the launch of this boat. And it made it about a kilometer and a half off the dock. And then a slight breeze came up and it heeled over and it took on water and it sank to the bottom, killing 30 or, 30 or so of the 200 people on board. There were five other similar boats that were in production at the time using the same design. And of course, it was a design flaw in this boat. And I'd like to give you an intuition that is, I think, very nicely reflected in this quote from the French philosopher Alain, whose real name was uh, Emile Auguste Chartier. He said, every boat is copied from another boat. Let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It is clear that a very badly made boat will end up at the bottom after one or two voyages and thus never be copied. One could then say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those which function and destroying the others. So the insight there is that the boat designers are not in fact doing top-down intelligent design. They're more like an agent of mutation in a Darwinian process. They create a, a variant of an earlier design, and every piece of software that I've ever written is exactly that, a variant of an earlier design. And most of the software that I've written has died. It didn't survive in the competitive ecosystem in which I launched it. And it wasn't quite as dramatic a death as the death of this particular design of the boat, uh, but it was properly viewed as the death of a mutation rather than a simply failed top-down intelligent design. So from this perspective, one might think that a software product like Snapchat is as much the product of teenagers as it is of the software designers who created it. So this perspective of technology is kind of a family of living things, a whole ecosystem of living things co-evolving with the humans is really the theme that runs throughout my book. So in the second chapter, I address this question of, well, what, what really do we mean by life? And the goal here is not really to argue that really we should literally take software as a, as a living thing but rather that drawing the analogy with life can help us to understand our relationship with this technology in, in much more depth. So if you go to my favorite living digital thing and look up life on Wikipedia, at least at one time, I'm not sure today I didn't check it, but Wikipedia pages change, of course, all the time. Uh, but at one time, there was an image like this that showed seven requirements for what it meant to be alive. Now, of course, there's no agreement among biologists that these are the right seven or anything like that. But I think they give us a useful guidepost for understanding in which of these properties are actually present in a software entity like Wikipedia. Well, I already mentioned it responds to its environment. Uh, that's uh, That's a pretty straightforward observation about Wikipedia and many pieces of software. This requirement that it have cellular structure and composition, well, it certainly has that. The picture that I showed you earlier of the, the bank of servers and the data centers that are scattered around the globe give it a cellular structure. What about growth? Well, it certainly grows. In fact, Wikipedia was launched in 2001 on a single server, and that server no longer exists. Uh, it's true, actually, you know, in the human body, uh, the cells in your body, very few of them are the same cells that you were born with. Your cells are being constantly replaced, but, you're the, but the entity continues, and the entity lives through that replacement of, their, of the parts. Uh, 
And that has certainly happened with Wikipedia. It grew from one server to a very large number, uh, a few hundred servers scattered around the globe. And during that growth, it continually responded to its environment with very few interruptions and only brief interruptions. And those, even those interruptions could be viewed as like treating a patient by putting them under anesthesia. So you cut off their interaction with the environment for a brief period of time, but the entity continues through that surg surgical process and through that anesthesia. Now, the other parts of the requirements for living are a little bit more of a stretch to draw an analogy, but homeostasis is actually a fairly easy one. That, that just says that, you know, the, the entity maintains stable inner conditions. And at a certain trivial level, that, that's true of the data centers. They have these computer controlled air conditioning systems that regulate the temperature. Uh, the chips in the servers have regulatory systems that do uh, voltage regulation to tolerate variabilities in the power supply and so forth. So there's various homeostasis mechanisms that you can find. Uh, metabolism is much more of a stretch, particularly if you design, if you define metabolism in biological terms, then certainly Wikipedia doesn't have metabolism. But if you de define metabolism as deriving energy from chemical reactions, then, and you think about where Wikipedia gets its energy, well, mostly it gets it from burning natural gas because that's uh, the predominant uh, electric power generation mechanism, at least in the U.S. And so uh, that is, in fact, deriving energy from chemical reactions. So it's not really a completely ridiculous analogy. Now, reproduction and heredity, are, to me, are actually the much more interesting properties. And the fact is that technological artifacts do reproduce, uh, some of them actually autonomously. My book talks a bit about, you know, computer viruses and worms, which are able to reproduce kind of on their own. But most technological artifacts currently require a tremendous amount of help from humans to reproduce. Heredity, however, is really by far the most interesting one to me. And this is where, if we, if we start to understand uh, technology development as being less top-down intelligent design and more Darwinian evolution, heredity becomes a very central feature. Now, the fact is there are, there are millions of juvenile wiki systems that are derived from Wikipedia. Uh, all the wiki systems on GitHub, for example, are enormously influenced and probably even have significant verbatim pieces of code that they share with Wikipedia. So there is a heredity mechanism where a piece of software does in fact show features that its, that its antecedents had and often actually includes code uh, that its antecedents had, sometimes quite very literally. So at some level, Wikipedia has all seven of these properties and that means that drawing an analogy with living things is really not quite as far-fetched as it might otherwise be. Now, I'm not the first person to draw this analogy. In fact, I first learned about this way of thinking from Kevin Kelly, who was the founding executive editor for Wired magazine. And uh, he wrote a book that's very much about this called uh, What Technology Wants and has given a TED talk about it. And um, he introduced the term technium and called this the seventh kingdom of life. I guess some biologists have sort of come to a big consensus that there are currently six kingdoms of biological life. And so he added a seventh. Now, Kevin Kelly included in his technium rather static objects. So he talked about a musical instrument like a coronet being a living thing or a hammer. To me, that's not quite right because in order to be living, you have to be a process, not a thing. So to quote one of my favorite philosophers, Daniel Dennett, uh, this is actually an indirect quote because it's Douglas Hofstadter, another one of my favorite philosophers, quoting Daniel Dennett, saying, it ain't the meat, it's the motion, to emphasize that life is a process, not a thing. Douglas Hofstadter pointed out that this is a somewhat subtle hat tip to a somewhat unsubtle, clearly erotic song that was written in 1951. As a side note, I don't think it's quite accidental that uh, Daniel Dennett cultivates this beard that makes him look an awful lot like 
Charles Darwin. This is a picture of Charles Darwin, and Daniel Dennett is tremendously an advocate of uh, an evolutionary view of many things in our world. Now, I briefly mentioned viruses and worms, which are computer programs that are able to reproduce themselves. And uh, here is a image that is showing a particular uh, computer virus. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a worm, uh, the blaster worm. And uh, this, these are the hex codes on the left and the uh, hex codes reinterpreted as ASCII. And you can see there's a message to, to Bill Gates embedded in the source code for this worm. In, in this chapter in my book, I actually look into the story about how computer viruses moved from being uh, pranks to being crimes. In some sense, there was a growing up of computer science when computers became networked globally and much more open. And it became actually a criminal activity to introduce these things into, into the networks. And uh, it hadn't always been like that. And of course, there's been a lot of activity in looking at computer programs that have the features, other you know, features that whimsically imitate lifelike processes. So one of the more famous ones is John Horton Conway's Game of Life, a little snapshot of that is shown here on the right in the screen. And this is a, um, a really enthralling view of how rather simple little mechanisms can create very lifelike behaviors. As a side note, I might mention that uh, John Horton Conway died very recently of COVID-19. So it, we're very sad to have lost him, of course, along with many other people who have been hit by this pandemic. Now, in this chapter, I also talk about Erwin Schrodinger, who is uh, of quantum mechanics fame. And he wrote a very interesting book in 1944, which was about 10 years before the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA, where he his book is called What is Life? And he Schrodinger was an expert in physics and pointed out that much of physics was based on statistical properties, large numbers of random phenomena sort of aggregate to create statistical behaviors. And he pointed out that life can't be like that, that life has to actually emerge from not statistical, but rather specific, rather specific mechanisms. Now, before, before people had an understanding of the, of the double helix structure of DNA, he conjectured that the source that the source of life was what he called an aperiodic crystal. And by this, he meant a stable molecule that would perform its actions not through statistical behaviors, but rather through precise reactions programmed into the structure of the molecule. This is very much like software. Software is not statistical in this sense either. Its behavior is dependent on every bit in the source code and in the object code. You flip one bit in a piece of code and the entire program can malfunction. And the same is true of, of DNA molecules. It's, uh, they're in this sense, not very robust because uh, permutations on them can have rather drastic changes in behavior, but they're also very stable and they're very digital. They can be copied perfectly. So this, um, analogy between the structure of code and the structure of DNA is actually potentially uh, quite useful in understanding this relationship and this analogy between technology and life. So this chapter also talks about a bit about the origins of life, which are really rather poorly understood. There's a famous experiment that dates back to 1934, the Miller-Urey experiment, where Stanley Miller uh, showed that the environment that is our best understanding of what early earth looked like was in fact able to produce amino acids, which were the basic building blocks of biological life. But there's a tremendous amount missing from the rest of the story, how amino acids become self-replicating molecules is not a well understood process at all, but there's a lot of conjecture 
that the early forms of self-replicating molecules really wouldn't look much like modern life forms at all. And if people back, if, if we were able to look at those uh, self-replicating molecules that were present in those early days, we would probably have a very lively debate about whether they were really alive or not alive. And, uh, you know, it's a debate that would be unresolvable, I think, much in the way that the debate about whether software systems are alive or not is kind of an unresolvable debate. So I just to entice you to read the book and not just listen to me, there's also a cameo appearance of, in chapter two of Emily Dickinson, but uh, you'll have to read the book to find out why she's in there. So in chapter three, which is called Are Computers Useless?, I address the perspective of technology as a cognitive prosthesis for humans. So the image on the screen shows a Sumerian tablet, which dates back to more than 2000 years before the Christian era. When these tablets were first discovered, of course the notation, the language that was written on them was not understood at all. Uh, when the language was finally deciphered, it proved to be a profound disappointment to many people. People expected to find poetry or stories about, uh, about early civilization, and that's not what they found at all. Uh, what they found were, were bookkeeping documents and uh, records, records very, that were very bureaucratic. And in fact, arguably, I think Yuval Noah Harari in, uh, in his uh, recent book, uh, Homo Deus, makes an incredibly good case that these uh, that these tablets were compensating for the deficiencies of the human mind uh, and the human brain. We're, we're actually not very good at remembering numbers. We're not very good at remembering agreements that we've made. Writing these things down is has become an absolutely essential extension of our minds. Working, working out things on pencil and paper uh, you can often work out much more complicated problems on pencil and paper, and the pencil and paper itself becomes part of your cognitive processes. And of course, today, with our smartphones and computers, uh, these are becoming very much a part of our cognitive processes. They're not just external phenomena. They're, they're processes that we integrate with our cognitive function. So in this chapter, I look at the question that, well, do these devices actually make us smarter or dumber? And this is a very controversial thing. In fact, I talk in this chapter about the Flynn effect, which uh, is the phenomenon that IQ scores have been rising quite dramatically over the last hundred years or so. This is a measurable increase in that particular measurement of human intelligence. And there's lots of reasons why this much might have occurred. Some of the theories argue that it is because of technology. I'm not sure that I buy those, but I, I present some of that debate in this chapter. But one of the interesting things I learned in researching the book is that if you look on a bigger time scale, the last 10,000 years or so, it turns out that the average size of the human brain has decreased by about 10% in the last 10,000 years. And the only credible explanation that I have heard for that is that we're, we've been able to offload some of our cognitive functions that are required for effective survival onto these intellectual prostheses, and it sort of alleviates the need for certain brain functions, and consequently we can get by with a smaller brain. So an interesting question that we might ask is, will the AIs that we're creating today, the artificial intelligence, intelligences become a cognitive prosthesis that actually integrates with our cognitive processes? That's possibly quite a different outcome from what the doomsday books that I mentioned before are talking about. Those books are talking about the AIs just stripping way ahead of humans and, and leaving us in the dust and then taking over everything and leaving us, uh, leaving us out of the picture. There's quite a different prospect, which is that they will actually become cognitive prostheses and become part of our own cognitive functions and possibly even maybe cause our brains, our brain sizes to further decrease uh, because maybe they will offload even more of our brain function over time. 
who knows? But that's a wild speculation, and this book isn't about speculations about the future. It's really more about trying to understand the present. So in chapter four, I address the question of what has the, the current revolution in AI, what is its significance, and how has it come about? Now, I think everyone agrees that the last 10 years have been a pretty remarkable time for artificial intelligence, and that a big part of the driving factors for that is the availability of huge amounts of data and also the uh, availability of effective, inexpensive computing. Those are very important. But one thing that many people don't seem to realize and, and bring quite to the foreground is that there's also been a, a, a very foundational change in the way that AI algorithms are constructed, that the way, the way that AI software is constructed. And I point out in this chapter that the introduction of feedback is really, at least from an algorithmic perspective, the key differentiator between modern AI machine learning driven AI particularly, and the good old fashioned AI that was much more uh, algorithmic and procedural that led to uh, systems like expert systems that I think were demonstrably less effective. This, this particular image is an image from, uh, that I got from just doing a search on Google for smiling cats. And the construction of such a collection of images can really only come from a rather sophisticated uh, image analysis and image understanding engine. And I talk a bit in this chapter about how those engines work, but particularly on how they depend on feedback. And feedback, of course, can, can be layered. And one of the things that I point out here is that we can look at the layering of feedback and understand that nested levels of feedback give you significantly improved capabilities. Now, this particular image is from the Google Deep Dream project, where they turned around machine classification, image classification algorithms, and tried to do image synthesis from them. So this is an image that was synthesized by an AI that was trained to recognize dogs. And so you could think of this as a synthetic image that particularly, that this AI particularly resonates with as a dog-like image. And of course, to humans, this is not dog-like at all. This is, in fact, hugely bizarre. But this, sti this work stimulated uh, a bunch of follow-on work on image synthesis that led to the development of a family of algorithms that are called generative adversarial networks, um, first developed by Ian Goodfellow. And what generative adversarial networks do is they overlay on top of the feedback mechanism in the basic machine learning algorithm, another feedback mechanism where you have AIs playing off against one another. One AI trains another and they're playing a game, an adversarial game to learn from each other. So this kind of layered feedback takes you to a different level of sophistication from classical feedback systems. So this is a picture of a classical feedback control system this is a World War II era anti-aircraft gun, very sophisticated piece of hardware, no digital computers in it, but it's a feedback system that effectively solves differential equations in order to predict the future location. In fact, what it does is it predicts the point at which an aircraft that is traveling in a certain way will, it's the, air, the path of the aircraft will intersect with the path of a, of a projectile that is also traveling in a certain way. It, it makes a prediction of the, that determines where that, uh, where that intersection of those two paths will occur. And then it figures out how to aim the gun in order to get the projectile to that intersection point at the right time. One of the key uh, contributors to that was Norbert Wiener, who was a MIT professor who coined the term cybernetics. So our cyber everything these days, uh, that term actually comes from Norbert Wiener. And um, it's interesting that he played a central role in the development of these kinds of guns. But that was a simple feedback control system. It's one level of control. And many of the AI systems that we have still only have one level of control. And in my book, I talk about this wonderful game you can play if you have two of these smart home devices, 
where you can, you can get them to have completely inane, totally repetitive conversations with one another, where they go on forever uh, talking to each other, un completely unaware that their conversation is completely inane and content free. This is an indicator of a, of a missing layer in the feedback control that's being used in these AIs. So chapter six is a rather short chapter because it talks about the problem of explaining the behavior of AIs. It turns out to be rather difficult to explain why uh, a classification algorithm based on deep learning comes up with the classifications that it does. And one of the things that I point out in this chapter is that it's actually the strength of these algorithms that they do things that we can't explain. Because if we could explain the mechanisms by which a decision is reached, we could use much more algorithmic techniques instead of these deep learning techniques. And we would end up back in the days of, of expert systems, which are effectively algorithmic decision-making things where you do have an explanation of how they work. So on this question of whether we should be viewing digital technology as living, um, I wasn't content to just say, well, let's go with that analogy and run with it completely. Uh, I think there are very good counter arguments. So chapter seven actually presents a counter argument that we really shouldn't be taking that analogy of digital beings too literally. So this chapter is called The Wrong Stuff. And it draws very heavily on w relatively recent work from psychology which is the concept of embodied cognition, which says that the cognitive human mind is actually an interaction between the brain and the environment. It's not something that exists in the brain by itself. So to quote es Esther Tellen, who was one of the uh, pioneers of this way of thinking in psychology, she said, the mind simply does not exist as something decoupled from the body and the environment in which it resides. So it turns out that there's quite a few people who have been exploring the use of robotics that is much more embodied. So this is a beautiful project that Josh Bongard was a leader on to build robots that are not in fact programmed to learn to walk, but rather they explore their own, their own bodies, their own machinery to, in order to learn how to navigate and these these robots can even be modified so if you take one of these robots and you pull off one of its legs it will struggle for a while but it will again it will learn again to walk in the absence of that leg so this exploration of embodied robotics i think is a very interesting development because it really takes these machines out of the completely digital algorithmic world and much more into the physical world. And it's very suggestive that once you get embodied where you're interacting with physical processes much more directly, that that could lead to some uh, pretty significant enhancements uh, in the technology. Chapter eight confronts this question directly about whether in fact we could reduce everything to digital algorithmic processes. And it addresses this question by asking the question of whether we as human beings are actually uh, underlying everything, actually digital objects. Many people actually take for granted that we are and that we just haven't reached the level of technology to enable us to understand how the human brain is a digital computer and how we can replicate the human brain in a digital computer. There are many people who believe that when the technology advances far enough, they will be up, able to upload their soul into a computer and become immortal. There are many people who believe that teleportation will eventually be possible, where you can take uh, and encode a, a human being as a digital byte stream and transport it to somewhere else. So in this chapter, I really confront this question about whether we are in fact digital. And I actually make the case that the hypothesis that we are digital is actually a faith. It is not a scientific principle. It cannot in fact be proven by experiment. It cannot be disproven by experiment. And consequently, it really can only be taken on faith. 
And my argument actually depends on a key result from Claude Shannon, where Shannon showed in 1948 that a noisy channel cannot convey more than a finite number of bits. And as a result, it's in fact the hypothesis that we can be replicated by a digital algorithmic process is not falsifiable by experiment. Now it turns out that this argument is actually a very, very subtle argument and it relies on a, a fairly deep mathematical uh, argumentation. And I didn't go through that mathematical argumentation in this book because it's not that kind of book. It would have, um, it would have left people out. There's pointers in the book to where you can find the mathematical argumentation. But what I ask you to do in this book is just consider the possibility that human cognition is in fact not reducible to a Turing machine, that it's actually doing something that is well beyond what Turing machines are, are capable of. So Turing machines are capable of digital and algorithmic processes. Algorithmic processes, in, al in an algorithmic process, everything occurs in a sequence of steps. And the, the stimulus and response from an algorithmic process is always a sequence of bits and ultimately always a finite sequence of bits. And we really have no reason to believe that the physical world is limited to algorithmic and digital processes. And we have no reason to believe that cognitive processes are, are so limited. I, sh I have shown through these mathematical arguments that we have no way to prove that they are or they are not uh, digital and algorithmic processes. Uh, but it really becomes ultimately then a matter of faith to believe that they are. Now you might argue that, well, DNA is fundamentally a digital molecule. It's, uh, it, rep it has about uh, two gigabytes of data, which is really not a lot of data by today's technology, a human DNA molecule. But I point out in the book that DNA is not a human, in fact, Every human alive today is right now at the end point of a continuous, unbroken, analog biological process dating back billions of years. So the process that is me right now started four billion years ago as a biological process and with no interruptions in those four billion years has led to a continuing biological process. And that continuing biological process carries a lot of information that is much more information than, is what, than what is in the DNA. And biologists understand that inheritance is more than DNA these days, but how much of it is actually in that continuous biological process as opposed to in these, uh, what, what Schrodinger called these aperiodic crystals, that's something that I think is not very well understood in biology these days. But nevertheless, the digital nature of DNA is not sufficient to prove that humans are in fact digital. So in chapter nine, I address this question of intelligences and there's quite a few stories in there about, uh, about uh, experiments like Google's Duplex, which is a project that tries to give very human-like dialogue mechanisms. Lyrebird, which does voice cloning, so you can actually have, you can, develop an AI that will imitate your voice and your speaking mannerisms. I really hope there's never an AI that uh, replicates my speaking mannerisms because I find my own speaking mannerisms kind of annoying, but nevertheless, the, you, there, are, there are AIs out there that, uh, that can do this. So there's several stories here, but really one of the key points in this book is to take on some of the more extreme views around the singularity and around transhumanism and to take on questions like the hard problem, which is um, David Chalmers' uh, description of the problem of, of consciousness. So how is it that a, that, a, uh, that a brain develops a consciousness? Now, I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think anybody has an answer for that. But I think it's, a, it's very interesting to ask this question in a rather different way. What would it take to build a machine, particularly a digital computer, that has consciousness? And I think there's a lot of insights that you can get about the question, even if you don't get any answers, by asking the question in the context of digital computers rather than humans. So in chapter 10, I look at the question of accountability. 
So when will we be able to hold artificial intelligence, all artificial intelligences accountable for their actions? I think this is an important question these days. We're talking about putting self-driving cars on the road. They're gonna be capable of doing a tremendous amount of damage. So at what point are we gonna be able to hold them accountable for their actions? So I start out this discussion by looking at a rather remarkable phenomenon, which is this portrait that's shown in front of a picture of Pierre Fautrel, who is an artist. And he took a program that was written by a teenager, Robbie Barat, who is currently a student at Stanford. And Robbie's program was based on Ian Goodfellow's generative adversarial networks. So there's a, an inheritance chain for this program. And the Pierre and his colleagues with Obvious, there's three artists that were working together on this project. They used this program to create this painting, which then got sold at Christie's for $432,000. And there's an interesting question. I mean, they were presenting it as the first artwork created by an AI. So they were, in, in a way, my interpretation is their artwork is a piece of conceptual artwork assigning accountability to an AI for the production of an, of an artwork. And I think to me, it's a very interesting thought experiment that it creates and a very insightful thought experiment that, that you can form around this question of whether in fact AIs can or should be held accountable for their actions and what does it take to hold them accountable for their actions? Can they be held accountable for inaction? So the fact that a modern car will happily slam into the rear end of the car in front of it, even if it's equipped with an adaptive cr cruise control system that is capable of detecting the fact that it is about to run into the car in front of it, right? The, should we hold the AI or the living digital being in that car accountable for, for failing to act uh, as well as holding some system accountable for, in fact, acting? So these are interesting questions and they inevitably lead to the, a, a very difficult question, which is can AIs ever acquire something that resembles free will? And that's a gnarly question. And in this chapter 10, I relate a very fascinating debate uh, between the philosophers Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett on this question of free will and reinterpret their debate from the perspective of asking the question of whether AIs will ever be able to acquire something resembling free will. So I won't give you the, the punchline of that chapter. You have to read it. It's a, it's a rather nuanced question, and it's really more about clarifying questions than about giving answers. On this question of accountability, if we're gonna hold anybody or anything accountable for its actions, a premise, a requirement, is that we have to have a notion that that entity actually caused the outcome that we're holding it accountable for. It turns out that this question of causation itself is a rather difficult question. So Bertrand Russell, rather famously in 1913, challenged the very notion of causation, saying that it actually has no basis in physics. He said, the law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone era, surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. So that's a very colorful way of expressing a, of really launching a debate that continues in philosophy about whether the notion that action A causes action B is a human cognitive construction or something rooted in physics. So that informs the question of causality, especially when we're trying to talk about whether we can hold machines accountable for things they might cause. By changing the question into something about machines, we actually can get a lot of insight into why this philosophical issue of whether causation is a physical phenomenon or a human mental construct this ends up playing an enormous role in attempting to grapple with this question of whether we can hold machines accountable for their actions.
So in this discussion of causation, I draw heavily on the work by a Turing Award winner, Judea Pearl, who has shown that reasoning about causation requires first person subjective involvement. In fact, this issue of subjective involvement is anathema to, to, to at least to a classical view of science which really requires that everything be objective. And if reasoning about causation requires subjectivity and causation is central to your understanding of physics, how do you do science? That you end up with a bit of an inconsistency there. And so this question uh, comes to the foreground, particularly when we ask this question of whether machines will ever be able to develop a first person subjective self. Until they develop that first-person subjective self, if you believe Judea Pearl's argument, they will never be able to reason about causation. So chapter 12 goes into quite a bit more depth about this, more depth probably than it should in a book like this. It ultimately draws on the work of another three Turing Award winners, Shafi Goldwasser, uh, Silvio Micali, and Robin Milner, and draws the conclusion really that feedback, interaction, causation, free will, and accountability are all tied together in this enormous knot, that you can't address any one of these without addressing all the others. And that is, I think, again, in the spirit of not giving answers, it, it's an attempt to clarify the question of whether and how we should go about assigning accountability to machines. Now, the, why do we want to as assign accountability to machines? Well, uh, because the fact is that machines can do things that can be enormously damaging to humanity. So chapter 13 dives into detail about the pathologies that can emerge when we have globally networked systems. So this map is not a map of the progression of the coronavirus, although it has some interesting correlations with that, but this is actually the progression of the WannaCry ransomware, which is an internet worm that appeared in 2017. So in this chapter, I point out a few key points, which is that machines die. If we view them as living, should they have rights? Machines have pandemics. This wanna cry is a pandemic. I talk about a phenomenon that I call the information apocalypse, and I won't go into that here. You can read the book to find it. I talk a bit about surveillance economics and how this could be viewed as a pathological effect on human beings. And I talk about AI safety and how we can go about guiding the development of technologies in a way that benefits humans. My conclusion in this chapter is that in the partnership between humans and machines, that humans are actually the scarier part of that partnership. This is not the same conclusion that some of these doomsday books come to, but uh, that is the conclusion that I come to. And you could say, well, all right, you could rest on the idea that, don't worry, we can always pull the plug on the machines if they start to do things that are too horrible. But can we really? What do you think would happen today if we shut down all the computers on the planet? I suspect that the effects on humanity would be pretty devastating. And so pulling the plug, I think we're past that point. We no longer have that option if we ever did. So the final chapter in the book ties all of this together under a view of the idea that humans are co-evolving with the technology. That Human engineers are more agents of mutation in a Darwinian process. Now, in doing research for this book, I read this fantastic book by uh, David Quammen called The Tangled Tree and learned a lot about evolutionary biology and how it has evolved over time. I used to think that in biology, the way that evolution happened is that random mutations happen in a molecule like a DNA for example, due to either chemical effects in the environment or, or uh, cosmic rays that would cause a, a random permutation of some of the uh, atoms in the DNA molecule, and that that would lead to a, a mutation uh, 
of, uh, of a, a biological creature that was a mutant from its uh, ancestors, and that some of those mutants would be favorably adapted to the environment and therefore would go on and, and produce more progeny that had that same mutation. But it turns out that that view of biology doesn't actually work. It's unable, for example, to explain the rapidity of the, of the evolution of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So uh, David Quammen's book explains very nicely for a non-biologist like me, some of the things that biologists have discovered that makes biological evolution look a lot more like software development than it used to. One of the mechanisms, for example, is this mechanism that they call horizontal gene transfer, where a virus, which invades a bacterial cell and hijacks its DNA mechanisms, can carry off a chunk of DNA and then deposit that chunk of DNA in another bacterium, creating a mutant of that bacterium. So by analogy, a software engineer who is pulling together pieces of code from GitHub, pieces of code from libraries like the standard template library or Python modules or JavaScript modules, getting coding hints from Stack Overflow, is this person really functioning more like a virus? The, the software engineer is taking a piece of code from here and a piece of code from there and stitching them together to create what I call a new codome. And that new codome is a mutant on its prior versions and most of those mutations will prove unfit in the environment but a few of them will survive so this is what i mean by viewing software development more from an evolutionary perspective than top-down intelligent design the other thing that i learned from from Quammen's book was about this field of endosymbiosis that was really first brought to respectability by lynn margulis and this is a theory that explains the development of, of eukaryotic cells, which are the cells, the human cells in our body, which are really distinctly different from bacterial cells because they, they have organelles, they have a nucleus, they have a mitochondria, et cetera. And in this theory of endosymbiosis, the way that these evolved was not by this random mutation that suddenly a random mutation appeared that created a nucleus, but rather by the merging of simpler organisms. So one bacterium ingested another and instead of digesting it, made it part of its metabolic system and then figured out the, you know, the chemistry figured out a way to then replicate that dual construction uh, of merged cells. And this of course can get much more elaborate and can, can help to explain the mechanisms by which multicellular organisms come about where they come about first as colonies of single cellular organisms, and then those colonies start to acquire an entity ness of their own. So this has a very strong analogy with technology development itself. And in fact, even goes further because it suggests the possibility that uh, as humans are integrating technology much more into both our cognitive and our biological processes, uh, that we will eventually become cyborgs where we really can't function without the technology. So one of the things that the doomsayers about AI talk about is the fact that computers will learn to write their own programs and they'll be able to program themselves and improve their own programs. One of the things that I point out in my book is that today computers teach humans to program. I write a lot of software and I get a tremendous amount of guidance from the software itself. When I use an integrated development environment like Eclipse, Eclipse is actually teaching me how to program. GitHub is teaching me how to program. Stack Overflow is teaching me how to program. Some relatively recent developments like Jupyter are phenomenal at teaching humans to program. And they teach humans to program the programs that then teach humans to program. So there's this tremendous feedback loop that happens. So, I think that that's a much more interesting development than the one about the machines running off on their own and leaving the humans uh, as, uh, in the dust as separate and uh, irrelevant operators. So what is the human role in technology development? Well, we may not like seeing our mental cognitive processes as cogs in a relentless purposeless evolution, but maybe that's what they are. And I put my previous view, my old fashioned view, the top down intelligent design view, I call that digital creationism. And I think that 
it really doesn't hold water for me anymore. There are implications for policy. So think about this, right? Think about, for example, privacy laws. Why are privacy laws so ineffective? Well, under digital creationism, bad outcomes are the result of unethical actions by individuals. For example, people who blindly follow the profit motive with no concern for the societal effects. Under coevolution, though, bad outcomes are the result of procreative prowess. Technologies that succeed are those that more effectively propagate. And that's a different mechanism. And it suggests that the policies should be different to address that mechanism. So the conclusion is really that we humans nudge rather than control technology development. We change as technology changes. The technology changes the humans, and then the, and then the humans change the technology. So this is a coevolutionary process, and only if we develop a deeper understanding of that coevolutionary process do we have a hope of developing effective policies that ensure that technology serves humanity. So thank you very much. With that, I would like to open up for questions.